Hi everyone. The Galleon is one of the most romantic ship types in history. Long associated with sunken treasure, pirates, conquistadors and the Spanish Armada. The Galleons were the workhorses of Spain's maritime empire, protecting her interests in European waters, and ensuring that the Spanish crown benefited from the extraordinary wealth produced in her American colonies. The Spanish during this period were meticulous record keepers, giving us a wealth of information to help us define exactly what a galleon was. During the early 17th century, the Spanish government issued a series of detailed instructions, specifying exactly what they meant by a galleon. We know the proportions of these craft, how they were fitted out and provisioned, what guns were carried aboard them, and how many men crewed them. The role of the galleon is almost as important as its physical description. Although its origins are obscure, it eventually became closely associated with the Indies, the Spanish term for their American colonies. Silver from Peru and Mexico, plus gold, emeralds and pearls from the northern coast of South America became essential to the maintenance of Spain's position as a world power. The galleons made sure this treasure reached the royal coffers. Galleons also formed the spearhead of Spain's armadas which were sent to fight her king's enemies in European waters. For over a century, these amazing ships dominated the waters of two continents. The reconstruction. The rigging method comes from just before the lime when the mast was in line with the bowsprit. The top sail, top gallant sail and the yards are still so short that the upper square is I. Has a pyramid-shaped silhouette. The numerous crow's feet, and the often confusing roots of the bowlins and other parts of the running rigging represent the extreme to which this fashion for elasticity was taken. The vessel could serve equally well as a merchant ship or as a warship. It had a carrying capacity of 576 tons and an overall length of 52.5 meters. The maximum breadth was approximately 11 meters, the draft 4.5 meters. Stern view of the reconstruction of a galleon from 1610. The high, narrow, light stern was a typical feature of these ships, which were designed according to the method of hole molding, and had little buoyancy at the bow and stern. Bow view of the reconstruction of a galleon from 1610. The low forecastle, with sides leaning inwards at the forward bulkhead, was a typical feature of this type of ship. This resulted in a narrow base for the light beak head. This method of construction can be explained by the small amount of buoyancy in the bow region. Rib plan of the reconstruction of a galleon from 1610. In this design the top timbers, which define the shape of the upper part of the ship's sides, are still straight, and not curved inwards, as was to be the case later. Sections of the hull of the reconstruction of a galleon from 1610. We can see the powerful hanging knees which join the deck beams to the ribs and the whales. Strong riders, vertical and diagonal pillars steadied the floor of the hull if it came aground. Galleons as warships. Throughout the age of the galleon, the Spanish never realized the full potential of their naval artillery. For most of the 16th century, shipborne ordnance was regarded as a supporting weapon, used to soften up the enemy prior to the decisive boarding action. After the experience of the Spanish Armada campaign of 1588, Spanish naval commanders came to view their artillery as a more versatile weapon, and trained their crews to conduct standoff artillery duels as well as boarding actions. Indeed, this practice had begun as early as the 1520s, but it was never fully adopted by the Spanish apart from when engaging targets on shore. During the 16th and early 17th centuries, Spanish naval ordnance was invariably mounted on single-trailed, two-wheeled carriages, more akin to those found on land than associated with use at sea. This changed during the first half of the 17th century, as the Spanish gradually adopted the form of carriage which by this stage was widely used by all other maritime powers. Therefore, by 1630 at the latest, the heavy ordnance carried on board galleons was exclusively mounted on practical four-wheeled carriages using trucks rather than large wheels, in effect primitive versions of the carriages used by all Atlantic naval powers throughout the 18th century. 
In addition, the obsolete wrought iron breech loading guns, which were carried for much of the 16th century, were gradually phased out and replaced by more reliable bronze muzzle loading pieces. These earlier pieces were adequate when used as point blank weapons, but lacked the range to participate in longer range bombardments or artillery duels. By the time of the Spanish Armada, Spanish galleons carried modern bronze ordnance, but their commanders had still not worked out the best way to use them. A detailed analysis of ammunition expenditure during the campaign shows that even as late as 1588, the Spanish still clung to the notion of fighting boarding actions at sea rather than artillery engagements. Each Spanish gun was placed under the command of a ship's gunner, assisted by a crew of sailors and soldiers. Once the piece was loaded, the crew dispersed to their other action stations, leaving the gunner alone, clutching his burning match cord, waiting for the order to give fire. Spanish naval doctrine emphasized the collective firing of the ship's broadside guns immediately before boarding an enemy vessel. The superbly trained Spanish infantry would then board the enemy vessel in the smoke. Given this tactic, there was simply no need to reload the gun until the action was over. In other words, the Spanish viewed their ordnance as weapons designed to support their infantry rather than the primary offensive weapon of the ship. Throughout the era of the galleons, it was the ship-borne Spanish infantry who formed the most potent weapon in the Spanish naval arsenal. Other maritime powers were unable to match these Spanish infantry in close combat at sea, which meant that if a Spanish galleon managed to grapple and board an enemy ship, the enemy vessel was as good as lost. The 1588 campaign demonstrated that, in terms of tactical thinking, the Spanish had been overtaken by their rival maritime powers. During the campaign the English commanders consistently refused to let the Spanish board their ships, preferring to remain outside caliber range and fight an artillery duel. This forced the Spanish to re-evaluate their tactics, and come up with a way to use their ordnance in a more versatile fashion. The first remedy was to detach the soldiers from artillery duty, leaving it up to the sailors to handle the guns. After all, they were more skilled in the mechanical tasks involved. Next, a review of carriages was made and, although it took four decades, the Spanish introduced more suitable carriages. Finally they turned their back on large and prestigious warships, favoring smaller galleons such as those built for the Indies trade rather than service in the fleet in European waters. All this took time. To be fair, other maritime powers were also trying to work out how to use warships as floating batteries, and it was not until the mid-17th century that the English and Dutch developed the concept of the line of battle.
Thanks for watching.